Overs and unders, baby. Yeah. When something is over in the world of professional wrestling, it means the fans love it. It means whatever they're doing, whatever they got going on, people just can't get enough of it. This here is overs and unders, where I'll be talking about teams who I believe are over and teams that I think are under after last weekend's competition. At your service, my name is Leo, and I've dedicated a good chunk of my life to commentating and covering MLBB Esports, specifically MPL Philippines. We're currently at the 13th season of MPL Philippines, and after week two, overs and unders are definitely shaken up. Let's get to it. One over team is a team that has been over since the very beginning. I'm talking even pre-season 13, and that's the defending world champions, the defending MPL Philippines champions who's won titles from all over the world before taking it back home and continuing to dominate, that's AP Bren. A running joke that we have on desk is we can't find continuous ways, we can't find more words to describe what AP Bren has going on. And I'd like to think that's not 100% true. I'd like to think that there's some way still that AP Bren can improve and that maybe some way, somehow, there is a team who might exploit that and give them the first loss. But it hasn't quite happened yet. There is not a single game in Season 13 that they have lost, nor a series, and they are the record holder for two of the longest games in the season so far. One against Blacklist at 33 minutes, and another against Minana Evos at 34. But still, that doesn't change the fact that AP Bren are near perfect. AP Bren are flawless when it comes down to results, and we don't see any sign of them slowing down. Let's talk about an under team who was once besties with AP Bren in the earlier years of MPL Philippines, and that is Smart Omega, touted as Bagong Barangay, the new Barangay, given that they started Season 13 with a fresh-faced roster. Their starting five was composed of MDL players or players who are much younger compared to the other half. And weirdly enough, in week two, nobody expected this and there were some signs uh, foreshadowing, uh, especially in the social media, that Smart Omega was going to field the roster I like to call OG, OMG. The same roster that had Jom, Ribo, Exhort, H2O, and Riota. We weren't expecting to, to see them play sooner than week two. I mean, I personally didn't, but now that they have, I'm starting to wonder which roster works better and which roster were they planning to make work anyways? Because Smart Omega has yet to win a series. Uh, they won a game or two, maybe just a game, but it's so hard to see what their winning image is. Uh, one stickling point that a lot of us on desk have noted was their cross-map control. Uh, they, they seem to struggle with maintaining their priorities across the map, even if their mechanics are good, even if their moment-to-moment -moment team fighting and decision-making is good. Something somewhere on the map slips, and in MPL Philippines, in a league where macro is king, wherein we pioneered the Lord Dance, not just by being good at the Lord Dance, but by controlling the map, by making sure our long lane and our mid lane control is on point so that there is no possible clapback. They seem to struggle with that very clearly. So not so sure if that's a shot caller issue or if that's synergy, because their mechanics are solid. I can confirm that each player individually is good. It's just maybe they haven't connected as well yet, so their communications aren't as polished as the others, definitely puts Omega here in the under category for week two. I saw our over team again. This time around, let's visit the House of Highlights, take a ride on the Orcas as they once again blitz through week two, Echo Express serving it up. And they're doing something reminiscent of uh, their season 10 iteration, if I'm not mistaken, wherein in the MPL alone, they were running Echo Loud and Echo Proud, meaning they had two five-man rosters or some configuration of a roster that constantly changes match in, match out, or week in, week out, if I'm not mistaken, in the case of Loud and Proud, season 10. But yeah, no, here, if you watch their first match, the match after that would have a different jungler and gold laner. So they got Carl Tizi and Benny, Zaida and Outplayed. 
and both lineups actually work. Both lineups have their own little minute differences or little tendencies even if you like to call that. But so far, Echo are undefeated. They've lost the game, but they've yet to lose a series. That puts them over, definitely for me. A team that is in the under category in week two is a team that I had super high hopes for. A team that I originally put in the over category preseason, but after several configurations already, just two weeks in, RSGPH seems to be struggling. Uh, they have a version that runs Aquanibor. They have a version that runs RTZ Nats. And then just last week, they started doing Aqua Nats, which I think does better than RTZ Nats, but they haven't won just yet. I don't know if the metagame is a little too fast. Uh, I don't know if the metagame is a little too in your face, given that right now, close range and mid range are king, and players like Aqua used to flourish in a larger range meta, and even Kusei, I dare think. So now, looking at where RSG is, I just have to be objective about things and put them under so that we're not blind to the fact that they're still struggling, they're still figuring things out. But again, I'll mimic what I said in last week's overs and unders. This puts them in a spot wherein at least they know what to work on and that there's time and that they're still up to Coach Panda's trajectory, wherein we start maybe low or start crawling before we can run, jump, and fly into the playoffs. That's, I think, the RSG plan. But for now, just keeping it real, they're under for me. Let's talk about a team that I did not expect to put in the over so quickly, and that is Onyx PH. In last week's Overs and Unders episode, I was really, really hard on them, uh, given that it seemed like they had their own meta game, and it seemed like they were just trying to cheese out the meta, cheese out the other teams, cheese out their matchups. But this time around, they're able to keep a good chunk of that true. Uh, they were able to field heroes like Gold Lane Freya and get away with it too. I, 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 it feels dirty saying that's a thing, saying that works, but they did. It happened. And without having to change their roster too, I mean, it's not like they have any choice, but now it really feels like they clicked. Something happened. Something went right. The super fam is on their way to proving the haters wrong. And much to Kelra's pleasures, because he's the one who says, yo, keep it coming, keep it coming. All you haters, y'all are who fuel us, y'all are who make us feel more motivated to prove it on the battlefield that we are more than what you thought us for. And right now, I, I'm being proven wrong. Like a week later, immediately, I'm getting them over. Like they are, I'm, I'm over for Onik. The super fam is real, they're so fast, they're so aggressive. They always have a ace in the hole, it seems like, and I'm excited to see where they go with this. One more thing about Onyx PH is they seem to have their own version of Omega Timers. Here I'd like to call it Onyx Time. It's when Kelra is ready to go. The rest of the team, the four man, can actually make things happen, but it's, it's all really just a setup for Kelra to go ham and say it's Onyx Time, and then they win from there. That, that, that's what their game kind of looks like in general. That's just something I noted. And you guys like that term, Onyx Time, for, for this version of Onyx? Let me know. One more team that's under for me, and uh, again, they did win, but these wins were hard-earned and very, very grindy. Seems like Blacks International has some things to work with. I don't want to use the word failure, nor do I want to use the word faults. It feels like a lot of the struggles that they went through this week were because of fumbles, because of little miscalculations that were still course corrected and eventually got them the dub, or at least got them to a point where they wouldn't get as punished as hard. That's what Blacklist is looking like right now. And luckily, the scoreboard will not reflect how hard these, this week was. And also luckily, there is a long break. So they can really get in there, study what went wrong, see if there is a merit to switching up the roamer, and see how hard they want to go into switching that up and which matchups will that play a role in? So there is a Kimpoi version of Blacklist. There is a Haji version of Blacklist. How that interacts with everything else that they do, how does that change the way they play for the rest of season 13? We've got five more weeks to go. At least 
we can all rest easy and know that Edward still plays Edward. Abun Jing Jing does Abun Jing Jing things. End of the week with a back-to-back MVP performance. At least that will keep us going. But that doesn't change the fact that as a whole, their performance earns them an underrating for me. Last but not least, let's talk about an over team here in TNC Pro Team. I am happy for the Phoenix. I am happy for they who always rise because I think they're finally playing with the first five that they plan to play with from the very start. Uh, nowhere in any of their preseason promotions did they say that Nomad was a roamer. And by starting week one with Nomad in the room, I, I, if, if what Yoshi said was true, that he was sick and that he could not focus on the game and let the others play first, that's definitely valid. I, I wish him all the best and I hope Yoshi, as now the team captain, roamer, hopefully for the rest of the season, I hope he's well and good and I hope that TNC continue this upward trajectory. And truth be told, Nomad did very well in the Golden Age. Nomad did great things. The, the whole team did great things. And I got to say, Mean Dean, Ryzen, stole a good bunch of lures this weekend that did not at all belong to TNC. And that just shows that on a mechanical, singular, individual scale, all MPLPH players are amazing. It's just really how you make up for that in synergy and how you communicate and you get one over your opponent while they're still figuring out what to do next. That's what makes the difference between a champion team and a team that wants to be a champion in the land of champions. So I'm proud and I'm happy for TNC that they finally got a dub. Uh, their actual first win was against Blacks International, so very good as well. And I think that has to admittedly go into the calculation of me putting Blacklist under just because of the whole change in scale, but all the more. Uh, support the Phoenix, again, one of the most beloved teams in all of esports, not just MLBB, but the fact that they're still here, that they keep fighting the good fight, and now that they have a roster and a lineup that they can field and be proud of and have their full confidence behind, makes this a more interesting week and weeks to come. Last but not least, let's talk about uh, one more team that's under, because if you do the math, I've already talked about seven so far, and there is one big name that I gushed over almost unstoppably, so with last weekend, and that's Minana Evo. So they are currently under for me in week two after competition, because it seems like playing what you know and the comfort that you have can only take you so far. And how far is that? 34 minutes, 31 seconds against the world champions, almost winning it, almost taking them down, almost giving them their first game loss in a long while, but not quite yet. Now, this might be a very elementary way of deducing what's wrong or in judging Minana Evos's performance, but this goes 50-50 because sometimes they make it work, right? Uh, one might question their hero pool because I think save for the Riz, save for the Arlo. I know I'm tilting quite a bit of people, but y'all can't stop me. After these two heroes, I want to see more from Kirk. I want to see Kirk play a solid pack. I want to see Kirk play maybe like a dead lane type of uh, XP laner, like a uh, Tams. Uh, I want to see him play a Laps. I want to see him play a Benedetta, because like, that's a thing nowadays. I want to see him play Yu Jong. Um, does Kazen want to whip out uh, more assassins? Is that a thing that they want to trade for, right? Uh, do they want to try and go for a Nolan Gambit? Uh, do they have a lineup that plays around a joy? Hacker Miles is a thing these days. H-A-M, when your opponent goes ham, what do you do? Where do they go from here? Because that role of Faramis didn't really do much. So it's these questions that come up when I try to figure out what Minan Evos can do to bounce back, to maybe crawl their way back into becoming an over team. Not for my sake, not for this show's sake, but for their sake as they try and break it out of top eight contention. Or could it be that, again, in their execution, to each his own, your mechanics are set, where else can they polish their inter-squad execution? Where else can they find ways to 
make better what the others are doing is because there were times when Doming just wouldn't die. Doming just couldn't die. But what do you do with a singular carry? What do you do with a singular gold laner without peel? So that's what I hope not just Minana Evos, but more all the other teams pay attention to. The fact that you need to still cover your fundamentals. Uh, that is peel, vision, wave clear, uh, re-engage, CC. Uh, and I'm not talking about the hero, but, but, but she's here and there. I don't know what the exact stats are. Speaking of which, stats were whack, but now it seems to have normalized. Uh, after week one, win rate for blue side was sitting at 69. 69% to 31%. That is unhealthy. Unhealthy. But now we're looking at about 57 to 43 percent, which is slightly better, uh, but still very, very blue centric. So that means whoever plays their blue side gambit better or have solid answers as red will maintain a better record. And again, this is very important when you're playing with either three points or one point or no points. I think after week three, after the long break, is when we'll really see what this new point system brings. It's because that's when teams can start calculating how many games do I have to win, how many series do I have to win, and see where everyone else lands if they do the same. It's been tough being a member of the Hokbo. I, I can't stress that enough. And I want to root for them, but with the way that this week went, I got to be real with y'all. I got to be real with them and with myself and put them in the under category after this weekend of competition. That's it for another episode of Overs and Unders. I hope you guys have a very, very fruitful week and ahead because it is a longer weekend. There is a break. If you enjoy this kind of content and all of the ones that I put out, you got a good friend of mine, Ray Ash, to thank. He uh, edits this and makes sure that you guys get good content, that I stay honest and actually provide the content that I promised I would. Give him a like, give him a follow, and give this page or channel a subscribe, like, follow, subscribe, and hit that like button with a ring of order if you want to. Maybe we'll see some high loss action once again come through in week three. But with that said, again, at your service, my name is Leo. Follow me on my socials at leocastsph. Check out my website, leocasts.ph. Y'all have a great weekend. Peace. Yeah, we always rise, baby. T and C gotta win. Yeah, we always rise, baby. T and C gotta win, baby. Paglalabang kita, ipaglalabang kita, ipaglalabang kita. Sir Ben, ipaglalabang kita, ipaglalabang kita, ipaglalabang kita. Ooh.